Good afternoon. My name is Terry Goldberg. I'm the Executive Director of the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association, or NMOA, and I want to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on teaching practical strategies for reducing wasted food through community events. We have a number of people who are just joining us now, so I'm going to wait another minute or so and let more people join us before we begin the presentation this afternoon. So thank you for your patience and just hold on a minute while um, a lot more people keep joining us. So good afternoon, this is Terry Goldberg. I'm the Executive Director of NMOA, and I wanna welcome you to the NERC and NMOA uh, webinar this afternoon on teaching practical strategies for reducing wasted food through community events. We're excited to have a great panel and I think some um, fun presentations today. I'm sure by the end I'm gonna be hungry from thinking about um, all the food that we're gonna be talking about. Um, I just before we uh, turn it over to the presenters, I want to um, make sure everyone understands that we are recording today's webinar. Uh, we will have ample time at the end, we hope, for some questions and, and answers. Um, we're going to have about an hour of presentations followed by what we hope is about a half an hour for questions. For the questions, we, we will keep everyone muted throughout the webinar. There's a large number of people who are uh, with us this afternoon. Um, so when you have questions or comments that you wanna share uh, on your GoToWebinar panel, you should see a row for questions. And if you click on the box with the dash through it, it will open up and you can um, ask your questions, um, post questions. And if we can answer them, uh, while the presenters are talking, we will. Um, otherwise, at the end, we will moderate uh, Lynn Rubenstein, who's the executive director of NERC. She'll be uh, moderating a question and answer session and, and trying to get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. Um, we've also posted three handouts uh, that have been prepared by the presenters. And um, please uh, avail yourself of those handouts and, and download and use them. If you have a uh, comment or about the GoToWebinar platform or anything you want to communicate with myself uh, during the webinar, um, any issues you're having uh, logistically with the webinar, you can use the chat feature. Um, again, that's towards the bottom of your control panel. And if you click on the little box, you'll see um, how to enlarge the chat feature and you can type in your chat and I will be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Um, so, uh, we're going to have the three presenters um, go through their presentations, and then we will have the question and answer session at the end. So, we have, uh, as I said, three presenters today. Uh, the first will be Anne Bijour, who joined the Waste Management and Prevention Division of Vermont's Agency of Natural Resources in 2017. And she works with a team to implement Vermont's recycling, composting, and waste reduction initiatives. She is a sustainability professional with more than 15 years experience designing and delivering education and communication programs for both the nonprofit and private sector, including Shelburne Farms, 
and all earth renewables. Our second presenter will be Gary Feinland. Gary has worked for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for over 20 years, most of that time with the Bureau of Waste Reduction and Recycling. Lately, he has focused on reducing wasted food, food donation, and recycling of food scraps, along with his peers in the organics reduction and recycling section. Gary has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Rutgers School of Engineering, I'm sorry, School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, and a master's degree in environmental science uh, from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Our third presenter is Jesse Kearns. Jesse is a program coordinator with the Syracuse University Center for Sustainable Community Solutions, where he works to provide sustainable materials management, education, outreach, and assistance to communities and stakeholders throughout New York State, especially regarding wasted food reduction and composting. He is current, he's also the current chair for the New York State Organics Council, a committee of the New York State Association for Reduction, Reuse, and Recycling, frequently called NISAR. He has a bachelor's degree, I'm sorry, a master's degree in environmental science with a focus on coupled natural and human systems from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So uh, I want to thank all the presenters today and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Anne. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. Um, so part of my job at the state of Vermont is to do education and outreach about our universal recycling law. And there are two goals for the law. One is to reduce waste generation overall. And the second is to increase recycling and composting. So starting in March 2019, um, along with a Vermont chef named Jim McCarthy, I developed and ran three workshops on food waste reduction that we called Use It Up. And originally my goal was to do 14 and try to do one in each county of Vermont, um, working with our solid waste management districts, but something called COVID came along and had a different idea for me. So I wanted to really thank NERC and NUMOA for the opportunity to continue this important work to encourage and teach others to help reduce wasted food. So we are going to present a range of opportunities to engage with people on wasted food, um, on the wasted food problem in person, which we hope to do again soon. And I just wanted to also let you know at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about our part two webinar that we're planning, um, which would be a virtual online recook cafe. So a little bit of background, when, I, when you think of food as part of the waste stream, the state of Vermont has been very focused on composting and food scrap diversion. Hopefully some of you know that Vermont is the first state to require all residents to separate food scraps from the trash. Um, the final phase of the universal recycling uh, law went into effect just on July 1st. So we're in uncharted territory. Um, but we've, we've focused so much, I feel like, on composting that many ref Vermonters refer to the universal recycling law as the compost law, and unfortunately not the waste reduction law. So I've really been wanting us to move uh, farther up to the top of the hierarchy to focus on source reduction, um, because we really want to help people reduce waste overall so they don't need to compost as much. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of the workshops that I've held. Um, usually they take place in about an hour and a half to two and a half hours. So I'm just gonna kind of whip through a lot of the slides. I'd be really happy to share the slides along with the notes to anyone who wants to go ahead and run their own workshop. Um, and first I wanted to thank Claudia Fabiano from the EPA because she was the one that originally shared her slides and presentation notes on a similar event. And so my workshop are, are really based on her work. And I also wanted to give a shout out to the Food Too Good to Waste group that she facilitates. Um, they're really interesting, helpful monthly discussions and that gave me the tools, the motivation and really the confidence to run these workshops on my own. So the, the workshops I run are pretty small, um, intimate gatherings, like up to 25 people at most. And Gary and Jesse are gonna talk about ways to reach larger groups. So this is the outline. Um, we talk about, I start with talking about the problem of wasted food, how much is being wasted, why it happens and why we should even care about it. 
And then we go right into the strategies to reduce wasted food, um, which includes cooking. And at the end of the workshop, we share uh, usually a very delicious meal together. And we do talk at the end about what to do with inevitable food waste and how Vermonters can uh, divert their food scraps from the landfill. Um, so I also wanted to share some tips or things to keep in mind when you're designing programs. Um, it's a lot like teaching kids when you're uh, working with adults. Um, you got to keep it hands on and fun. You should tell stories and help people visualize problems so that they can have some context for their own lives. Um, and then you really want to create an emotional connection in order to um, make sure that behavior change will last and people will follow through. And that's also um, taking a pledge and setting an intention is going to help make sure people continue with these new behaviors. Um, and some of those ideas come from these two books that I'm highlighting. If you if you haven't um, checked them out before, I, I really um, encourage you to. Fostering Sustainable Behavior about community-based social marketing on the left and Switch How to Change Things When Change is Hard by the Heath Brothers on the right. And last but not least, try to keep it simple. People's lives are so busy and um, if you can kind of reduce your messages down to a few things that really sticks. So one of our Vermont campaigns, um, we, we just uh, kind of keep talking about eat what you buy and compost the scraps. So in the workshops, we start with introductions. The point here is to create a positive group dynamic and have people feel comfortable sharing with each other. I'll usually focus on either one, the first group of questions or having somebody tell a short story. Um, and you want to foster this group dynamic because often people will learn as much from each other as from presenters. Um, and then when people are asking or answering the question, what do they hope to learn? I usually write them on a flip chart or on a chalkboard or something that you have in the room because it gives you a prompt during the workshop to go back and address people's questions. And you always want to model the behavior that you want. So when you're giving your introduction, you want to be short and concise because otherwise the introductions can take a long time. So then um, studies show that people won't change their behavior unless they feel this emotional connection to a problem or a solution. So I think both of these videos do that. I tend to prefer the love letter to food. Um, we're not gonna watch these now, but again, I'll share the, the links if you'd like to. Um, the love letter to food is a little over three minutes, I think, and it does a great job of summarizing the problem of wasted food um, before I go over it with the participants. Um, and also does a really good job, I think, showcasing racial diversity and different ages and genders of Americans. Um, but the strawberry video is pretty great too. So if you haven't seen it, um, watch them both and then you can decide, um, depending on your audience, which one you wanna show in your own workshops. So then I go into the problem. And um, yeah, uh, most people on this call, I think will probably be familiar with some of this information and um, just keep in mind that your audience might not. So um, again, I'm gonna show a bunch of different slides on the problem and when you're running your own workshops, you can decide which ones, um, which ones to use. And I wouldn't go too heavy on the problem um, part of the equation. So up to 40% of food in the United States is never eaten. How do we know that? Um, NRDC put out this report, Wasted, in 2012, and it did a great job of kind of sparking this national conversation about wastefulness and its consequences. So 40% food uneaten, on average, uh, each American wastes about a pound of food a day. Um, so it's actually about 400 pounds of, per person per year. So that's pretty sad. And it's also very expensive. So if you think about growing, processing, transporting, and disposing all of this uneaten food, it's an annual cost of about $218 billion to the economy. And if you remember from my very first slide, the, the photo of the chicken, um, the average household wastes about $1,500 annually on wasted food. So then I also like to point out that the tragedy is that there's also a hunger problem in the US. And one in four Vermonters is food insecure. I think it's one in eight or one in seven in the US. Um, and this is not to say that solving the food waste problem will solve the hunger problem. Um, 
but one of the most positive incomes of uh, outcomes, sorry, of Vermont's universal recycling law is the increase in fresh foods that were donated to the Vermont Food Bank, primarily by food retailers. Uh, the number has tripled since the start of the law in 2012. So how much food waste is that on a national level? I like to start with the big picture and then get down to the residential level, something that um, people can relate to. So many of you may have seen uh, ReFed's data. Um, I think this does a good job of laying out where it's coming from. So we're talking 62 and a half million tons of food wasted every year. Um, 52 million tons sent to the landfill um, and 10 million tons on farm. Um, I'll talk with the participants about why they're on farm losses and this idea that you know, many fruits and vegetables are never harvested because they don't match our definitions of perfection or the market changes and nobody wants baby kale anymore. Um, and and uh, so one of the things I like to encourage people to do is to reach for those ugly vegetables in the grocery store. Um, I'll tell an anecdote about my husband coming home with a bruised pepper and he was so proud of himself that he, um, you know, didn't put it back and pick a nice one because he knew it would be wasted. So any kind of those anecdotes that you can share with people really helps them um, realize that this is something they can do in their own lives. So then I go into where is all this waste coming from um, that's going to the landfill. And 2% um, is coming from manu food manufacturers and because they've really got to dial down what they make, um, they do it all the time. But 40% is coming from consumer facing businesses, including restaurants and grocery stores. And then 43% coming from our homes. So it's pretty sad that as consumers, we are responsible for 83% of the wasted food indirectly through the retail sector and directly in our homes. And this is just another way of showing that data. Um, again, I wouldn't show all these slides to one workshop, but it's up to you what your audience might relate to more. This is a nice colorful slide and it breaks down that um, the uh, retail sector between grocery restaurants and institutional food service. So then I like to get back to what does that 40% um, waste look like in a home, uh, or 43%, sorry. So in one month, a family of four wastes this much. This was a New York Times article. And um, I like to have the participants do the math. So, you know, 30 days, four people, it's 120 pounds of food wasted. And again, um, costing a family about $1,500 a year. So then I'll go into why is this waste happening? And I'll have the participants look at the photos and tell me what they think. So we'll talk about the burnt rolls and how people you know, don't have the cooking skills that they used to, um, or the stuffed fridge. You know, Many people are doing the shopping or you go to the store without a list and so you buy multiple things and you can't find anything that's in the back and it rots. Um, and then on the right, you know, we want to be good hosts, so we um, serve much more food than, um, than our guests can eat. And maybe people don't like leftovers. Other things that'll come up is this idea of aspirational cooking. So we have great intentions about cooking every night, but we get busy and we don't end up using all the food we bought. Um, we'll also talk about um, confusion about or misunderstanding date labels, and that'll come up a little bit later. Um, and then picky children, oops, um, sorry. And then we'll talk about why waste matters. And, you know, we wouldn't go into the shower, turn it on and let it run for 370 minutes without turning it off. But that's basically how much water you're wasting when you throw out a pound of beef and 60 minutes for rice. And there are lots of other ways to show people the, um, enormous natural resources used in food. And again, that will be up to you and knowing what your audience um, will relate to. Right now, we've been having a drought in Vermont, so I think this might work for folks. Um, but here's another example from NRDC that goes into different, um, different parts of the natural resources that um, you could talk about with your group. Um, so then I like to finish with drawdown and um, this idea that 
producing uneaten food just squanders a whole host of resources, but the problem is even worse because it generates greenhouse gases at every stage. Um, most, most people don't know that methane is produced when food ends up in a landfill. So we'll talk about that and then the fact that Project Drawdown identified the top um, existing solutions to roll back global greenhouse gases. And the third most powerful existing solution is reducing food waste. And by the way, composting is number 60. So just by reducing food waste, you can be a part of the solution every day. So then we get into what, what can we do? Um, I'll show people this poster on the left, which is from um, World War I, I believe. And this is just to show people that these behavior change that we're asking them to do. These actions are not new and scary. They're really things that our grandparents used to do all the time. Um, food used to take up a much larger portion of the average American's take home pay than now and was much more highly valued. So I'm just encouraging them to revisit the values of an earlier time. So then the four strategies that we focus on are first just shopping and planning. Uh, food storage, and then knowing when to eat foods, understanding spoilage and expiration dates, and then the cooking part of things. So before we get into cooking, we'll also um, read or read this intention. And because the chance of follow through again is higher if you ask people to set an intention before you actually do something. And I will make them read it out loud as a group. So the first strategy is smart shopping and planning. And we'll talk about just briefly things like making a shopping list with meals in mind, buying only quantities you need until the next trip, not buying any more than what you expect to use so that you can keep it fresh. Um, usually start with telling people to shop their kitchen first, look in their pantry, look in their freezer, look in their fridge before going to the store and don't go to the store hungry. <laughs> Um, buy ingredients that you can use for multiple recipes during a week. Um, and then be aware of sales and bulk purchasing because it's only a good deal if you actually use it all. Um, we also talk about scheduling a lazy night because are you really going to cook dinner every night that week? So only you only need to plan for a few nights worth of meals and then you can take an opportunity to eat what's in your freezer. So then the next strategy we talk about is storage inside or outside the fridge. Um, avocados as an example, they should be stored outside the fridge until they get ripe. And if you're not gonna use it right away, put it in the fridge. So um, by storing the fruits and vegetables for the maximum freshness, they taste better and last longer. So the other one other tip that I've always found really helpful is with cilantro or parsley, you know, like fresh flowers, you cut off the bottom of the stems and store it in a glass of water in the fridge. It'll last much longer that way. We'll also talk about the refrigerator and where things are best stored for longevity. Um, and then we'll talk about the freezer. Um, you know, whether you're storing your leftovers for later, um, milk you didn't drink before vacation, or that half-eaten jar of tomato sauce when you made pizza. Um, the freezer is great, just stick it in there um, and then you can use it later. And we'll talk about the importance of freezing in portions, allowing room for liquids to expand, labeling. And I think the most important thing here is to keep a list outside the freezer, usually just on the, um, you know, on the, do on the wall, on the door, um, that lists what's in your freezer. So you won't have to dig through it to find out the things that are in there. And then eating what you buy um, in your fridge, set aside a, a um, section or get a little box like this where you put things in it that need to be eaten first. It's a visual prompt that'll help you see what you need to eat before things go bad. And then understanding expiration dates. Um, we'll talk about the fact that they're not really expiration dates. They're not federally, re federally regulated. They're just manufactured suggestions or recommendations for when a product is freshest. Um, and the only exception being infant formula or baby food. Um, so then, you know, we really encourage people to rely on their senses. Look at it, smell it, touch it, and then taste it. And usually um, you can figure it out on your own. 
So then understanding spoilage, um, we'll show some photos like this and, and ask people what they think. Are these things that they would eat or how what, what would they do um, in order to eat it or make it edible? Um, Jim, the chef I worked with, came up with this worksheet and it's great to have to keep people occupied when they're cooking and um, there's not enough room at the station for everybody to be occupied at once. They can be working on this um, worksheet at the same time and then we can review it at the end. So it's things like, you know, in the picture, your strawberries, if they have fuzzy green spots, would you eat that or not? Um, how would you make it safe to eat? Oh, and those, um, well, so, okay. So then we have, uh, then we get to the cooking part. And these are the recipes we use. And I was about to say that on your um, handout section, I did provide the recipes if you're interested in looking at them. Um, and most of them use parts of vegetables and fruits that we don't always use. So kale stem pesto, broccoli stem hummus, things like that. So then the cooking strategies, we really just try to promote confidence in the kitchen using recipes as a starting point. Um, you know, if you're using only half an onion because the recipe calls for a cup, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Just put in the whole onion. Um, and then we'll talk about how to revive older foods like putting limp greens in um, ice water or putting old chips into the oven. Um, they'll be good to go. Um, we'll also talk about eating whole foods like beet greens and um, ditching the peeler, just scrubbing your vegetables. Um, and then when in doubt, using hero recipes where you can kind of throw everything in with a sauce and um, use everything up in your fridge. And the last cooking strategy we talk about is using up leftovers. So I'll have people look at these photographs and say, you know, what are those recipes? What are those dishes that are using uh, leftover. So we've got bread pudding and fried rice, but then people always come up with soups, omelets, curries, stews, things like that. And then when you're um, entertaining, look at the Save the Food has this great tool, the guesstimator, that helps you decide how much to cook. So here are some pictures of the workshops. They're really fun. They can be a lot of work, but um, Participants have really enjoyed them and um, came away with a lot of new ideas on how to reduce their food waste. And last, we do talk about what to do with food scraps um, and uh, encourage Vermonters to uh, use all the different options available to them. And we usually don't need this last slide on discussion because there's so much going on as we're cooking and we're walking around. Um, that, but, but it's good to have this in case you have a quiet group. And just a few considerations when you're planning, what are your goals for the workshop? Do you want to go into depth on certain kitchen skills, like knife skills or something like that? Or do you want to just, um, cover lots of different strategies and then to charge or not to charge? Um, one caveat is when we did a workshop at a library, they didn't want to charge and um, it was a gorgeous day after weeks of rain and so half the people didn't show up. And so you might wanna charge something, even if you can subsidize the cost to um, get people to come. And then location, look, trying to find a place that might have uh, cooking uh, things that you can use or something that isn't gonna charge you. Um, and then again, engage your partners. Try to get um, different folks to help you with marketing, with um, getting people to show up. And um, we did run one evaluation for our last, um, or sorry, for our first workshop, just to help us plan the other ones. So that's another idea. So the last thing are just some little things. Um, they are longer workshops, so you need to be organized and watching the time. Um, it's great to have the recipes as handouts so people can, can take notes while you, while you go over things. And then freebies, this waste-free kitchen handbook, a, a big plug for this resource. Um, one of our workshops, we had a grant and so we were able to provide these for folks. And, um, and then last but not least, try to promote reuse. So use cloth napkins and durable plates and glasses if you can, um, because it's all about waste reduction in the end.
So thank you. Um, I am happy to answer questions later. And again, we'll send you the slides if you'd like to do a similar workshop on your own. Thank you so much, Anne. Great presentation. We're going to move on to Gary's presentation. Take it away, Gary. Wonderful. Well, I'm so happy to be virtually with you today. Uh, thank you, Terry and Lynn, for setting this up and inviting us. And thank you, Anne, for doing such a wonderful job of setting the stage and talking about the, the resources that are saved by doing this work, as well as the joy that comes from reducing wasted food and teaching people about it. You know, we all have an opportunity um, with the coronavirus to educate folks about reducing wasted food. People want to go out less. Um, and they are already meal planning because of that. And so the tips that Ann shared are just, I think, resonate more with people than ever before. And people are also looking for connection. And so whether you're in an area of the country where you're starting to do small scale events or whether you're still online, there's a lot of opportunity for connection through food. So uh, like, some of you, I'm sure I've been on a journey. I have been a compost educator for a long time and have been transitioning for a while to include wasted food. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I also feel great that a lot of the resources that I talk about and has already brought up so many wonderful things out there. So um, I'm going to talk mostly about events and realizing that some of this isn't possible now, but virtual events are. This slide really shows a kind of difference in uh, education that I think Anne hinted at. And um, what I'm really talking about is community-based social marketing, which I've learned th mostly through the Food to Good to Waste group that Ann mentioned that's run through EPA, US EPA, um, about keeping the message positive that to help change behavior, people want something kind of small that they can do in their lives. So if you look at the right hand side, and I have to say that I had help with this particular board, display board from two of my colleagues, Christine Ellsworth and Nasiba Elmi at New York State DEC. If you look at the right side, to be honest, that's where my mind tends to go. And it's about the resources that are involved in wasting food. On the other side, the left side, you could see more of what you can do so that people can, you can have a conversation with folks and they can talk about what they do. And mm, there's some answers. If you flip those cards up, you'd see a bunch of answers. They're not all the answers. They're just conversation starters. Towards the bottom of the slide, there's some recipes that folks can grab. And we also had another uh, item called, um, that's about food storage, which people Really, people want to take something as much as in the sustainability mind. I don't want to have a lot of paper out there. We've tried QR codes and people don't, that doesn't resonate with people. I think they had a very brief window and now people don't use those when they want resources. All of those is take you to a website and they'd rather have it in their hands. The middle slide is, or the middle part of this is a pledge about wasting less food. And uh, it's something that we did through NISAR that um, was mentioned in the introduction, the New York State Association of Reduction, Reuse and Recycling. And so through those partners and Jesse, who's gonna talk is a big part of that being the organics chair, we developed this pledge. And as Ann mentioned, it's a way when you have a pledge people are more likely to follow through on an action. 
and the artwork on the right was turned into a magnet. Thank you to Jesse's team for um, coming up with that artwork. But you can see it's got a lot of the same suggestions that Anne talked about. Now, I think one of the things that's most important when you're doing any kind of event, whether it's virtual or in person, is the draw. This prize wheel on the right was a tremendous draw. When you're doing something with families and kids are involved, the fact that they could spin a wheel is huge. I underestimated how huge it would be. So each space on the wheel has an icon that's tied with a question on the board. And so, you know, a kid will say, can I spin your wheel? Please, can I spin your wheel? And sure, you could spin my wheel. And of course, I'm thinking, then I'm going to ask you a question. Then your family is going to come in and get drawn in. Then they're going to look at these resources as you're playing the game. And even though the spin board actually says spin to win, I've only had a couple people out of hundreds actually ask, what do I get? What do I win? Um, and you, you could tell them you, you answered a question right. That's what you get. And even if they, and by the way, that particular wheel costs less than $50 shipped. So it's about two feet tall. Um, I'm not saying you need a wheel, but it, I have seen the a huge increase in the number of people that come and spend time with me when I have that. So um, it surprised me, but that is the case. All right. So we've looked at NYSAR and at the EC at the Repair Cafe model, which for those of you that don't know, you can go to this event, bring an item with you, and be at a particular booth where let's say they have lamp repair and you could learn how to repair your own lamp. So we've thought about different ways we could engage people around wasting less food in a similar fashion. This idea of a recook cafe. So one of my first forays into this was actually at a repair cafe when we set up a booth in New Paltz, New York. And uh, there were about 75 people there. And mm, I'm gonna say 15 people were interested, maybe 20. And so what I realized, while that's good, um, probably not the best audience because folks go there with something to repair and bring home and that's their main mission. Uh, it was still great. There was a lot of interaction. I think one of my take home messages is the more interaction, the better around food. You know, when I showed that board that had the, uh, like, what do you do with a bruised apple? People wanted to talk and talk about their recipes and I'm writing notes. Oh, really? You could do that? Because, you know, we all learn. There are people who've been in their kitchens for 75 years. They know a thing or two about how to, you know, use all the food that they have. But so the, on the right hand side, you see that's people giving us suggestions for things that they do or that they'd like to do to waste less food. So I think engagement is really important. So then we tried a re-cook cafe of sorts on the conjunction with our nice our conference in the fall. And there's our lovely chef at the Otis Saga who, who worked to produce the thing you see on the right. And there was a like a tomato bisque and um, those are grilled cheese sandwiches with part of the cheese that can't be served on a cheese platter, but could still be made into a grilled cheese. And uh, working with chefs, I think, is really important. They're a big draw. There's so many cooking shows out there. People are used to that. And Gary finally coming and talking about this is not as exciting as the chef from the Oda Saga talking to you about it. So we got some community folks who heard that the chef was speaking through our outreach and came to the event, even though they weren't part of the conference, which was fantastic. So I only have a couple slides. 
don't go. I meant to say this at the beginning. Jesse's slides are eye candy. And so, uh, you know, even if Jesse wasn't a good presenter, which he is, his slides are beautiful. Um, I tried in my uh, to, to make my slides as picturey as possible. I think when you're zooming, it's important to not have a lot of words. So this is my word slide here. But um, we all get Zoom fatigue, so which is why the Recook Cafe that we're going to talk about virtually, um, we, we're excited about because it'll be different from a typical webinar. Not that webinars aren't great, but we all have a bunch of them under our belts. So these are some of the things I talked about. The content is accessible. I didn't talk about. I want to just throw out uh, something that didn't work so well. We had a table near the chef that was about canning and somebody who did a little presentation about canning. And it, it wasn't the right audience. It was, um, you know, folks were there to hear a little tidbits about what they could do in their lives. And canning is complicated. And you need the right temperature and in some cases the right pressure for it to work or it could be dangerous and so um probably not the best it'd be better to have that as a separate canning session that was specifically for people who want to learn to can something that might have gone over better is how to make quick pickles in a few minutes and store them in your fridge for a month or two um, finding ways to draw people in, such as the prize wheel, uh, a pledge. Mm. Again, people love to share about food, so they are talking about their experiences. And that leads to the next point about if you could, when it's food, discussion is fantastic. Uh, there are so many, everyone eats. Like if, when I'm doing compost education, I say, how many people compost, you know? Some people raise their hands. How many people eat? It's everybody. Everybody's engaged potentially in this. Uh, how to reduce what they don't eat. Concrete actions, that's based on a social based, community based social marketing. And uh, I mentioned chefs already, and Jesse's going to hit on that just briefly. What you see on the right hand side of the screen is my beautiful kitchen table with a celery and i just learned this this year like i said i'm on a journey that uh, the bottom was cut off and right now that that is in my garden and is about a foot and a half tall just full disclosure there's my eat me first bowl that i tried it wasn't big enough i went to an eight eat me first shelf which with all refrigerator shelves the stuff in the back is hard to get to so i really love epa's box and eat me first box but uh we're all on a journey that's me from a waste audit and i did not eat that food that was at the bottom of that container <laughs> thanks gary what Great. Sure. Um, I'd like to just uh, introduce Jesse for a bit, if I could. So he's going to talk about, of course, I misplaced my paper, but he's going to talk about partnerships between chefs and farmers. And really, the, his slides are beautiful. Jesse, take it away. Thanks, Gary. Um, and I want to thank everybody on the call today. It's really a privilege to be presenting to you. And I'm just really grateful for, for you giving me a little bit of your time today. Uh, it's been a while since the, the biography introductions that Terry gave. So just to remind you, my name is Jesse Kearns. I've got a master's degree in environmental science from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. It's a shot of me hiking in Scotland in 2018. Let's see here. I can advance these. There we go. I'm a program coordinator with the Syracuse University Center for Sustainable Community Solutions, and my work is focused on sustainable materials management. So creating and delivering waste reduction, reuse, and recycling uh, programming for communities and stakeholders throughout New York State. 
And I'm also uh, currently the chair for the New York State Organ Organics Council, which is a committee of the New York State Association for Production, Reuse, and Recycling. This is a picture from our 2019 Organic Summit. We hold these annually, and it's just a really great opportunity. We get more than 100 um, stakeholders from across the state that are working with sustainable organics management, and we have a lot of great discussions about what's new in the industry, what are some of the challenges that we're facing, and we usually have a big component of this focused on wasted food reduction and food recovery. So today I wanted to focus on two events that I helped to create and develop and facilitate in 2019, and I just wanted to quickly mention that both of them were uh, funded uh, mostly by the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, which is at the Rochester Institute of Technology here in New York. And these events were made possible thanks to their community grants program that they offer yearly. The first event that I want to talk to you about were cooking demonstrations that we conducted at the New York State Fair in late August of 2019. And the New York State Fair was really an appealing venue for me because it's such a huge draw to audiences. They, they have more than one and a quarter million people attend each year. And I just saw it as a great opportunity for me to, to reach a large amount of people and to get into different audiences, newer, more diverse audiences that I'm not typically drawing to my programming. So I did a little bit of research and discovered that in one of the buildings at the State Fair, they have this excellent demonstration kitchen. And they had actually already been doing uh, cooking demonstrations for a few years where they highlight chefs throughout New York State. The chefs come in and they cook one of their signature dishes and, and they teach attendees at the fair how to do it themselves at home. So what I did is I reached out to the coordinator who gets all the chefs together and plans out the week of demonstrations. And I pitched the idea of bringing in a chef and having that demonstration focused on all the things that people can do to waste less at home. This is an excellent facility. It's a fully functional kitchen. It's got ovens, it's got stovetop, refrigerator, pretty much anything that you can want, uh, you know, except for liquid nitrogen and a sous vide machine. It's got all your basic stuff there to, to do a demonstration. It's equipped with overhead cameras and large screen TVs so that everybody that's sitting in the audience can very clearly see what's going on on the workstation. And the presenters are also uh, outfitted with lavalier microphones. So their voices project and everybody can hear. It's a, it's a fairly big space too. For the, the two demonstrations that we did uh, during our day, we had a little over 40 people attend and there was, there was room for double that easily. The chef that I partnered with, his name is Peter Ricardo. He's a good friend of, of mine and, and Gary's. He's currently the product donations manager at the Food Bank of Central New York. Um, but he's also, in, in a previous career, uh, he was a trained chef. And so he, he's, he's just the perfect partner for these type of events because he sees the wasted food issue from so many angles. He sees the wasted food issue from his previous career as a chef, but he sees it now too from, from all the waste, from all the donations, from the communities that he's working with that are facing poverty and food insecurity, from just weird absurdities in, in the food supply chain. Uh, he he kind of sees it all as, as being that, that um, position at the food bank. And so it was really excellent. And I'm really grateful to him for, for coming along and uh, doing the actual cooking for me at these uh, demonstrations at the state fair. I want to tell you a little bit about Peter Ricardo's philosophy when trying to educate people about wasted food reduction. He really advocates for going back to basics. So, so often as practitioners, we're, we're going out and we're trying to educate residents by saying things like we got to cook root to root to leaf and nose to tail and we got to get creative with leftovers and peter's perspective is that in order to help people do that we have to go back and and teach them the basics of cooking first he sees that there's been a lot of knowledge just kind of lost in recent generations um, so number one food literacy do people know what all the different produce items are do they know how to process them do they do they know what their common app, app, applications are or do people have the confidence uh, to, to be cooking in the kitchen? Do they know the difference between chopping and, and dicing and mincing and julianning? Or do they know the difference between sauteing and frying, baking and broiling? Because once we're able to teach that back, to, to instill that in people, then they will have that diverse skill set that they'll be able to be creative with leftovers. Because without that, they're, it's kind of like giving somebody the blueprints to build a house. If they're not a carpenter, they're not going to have the skills to actually do it. They can see all the steps, but they're not going to feel very comfortable or confident doing it. So that's that's Peter's approach, and that's how he goes about his demonstrations. And he quite often kicks it off uh, by demonstrating the quote-unquote right way to cut an onion. 
And so uh, in this stock image here, you see this chef, um, the, the process is really pretty simple. You cut the onion in half, you put the flat side down on the cutting board so it stabilizes that piece. Uh, you take off the paper thin outer skin of the onion and then with very small precise cuts, you take off a little bit of the flower end and you take off kind of that hairy end of the root. And by leaving the root end mostly intact, that's gonna keep your onion together while you're making all your cuts. So first you make those long longitudinal cuts that uh, the chef in the photo is, is making and then you do perpendicular cuts and you're done. It teaches, uh, in, in one fell swoop, it gets across two points that, that Peter wants to make. Um, those knife skills, so he's showing you number one, how do you hold a knife in your knife hand? What's the angle? How do you hold your other hand so that you're stabilizing the produce, um, but that you're also being safe and you're not gonna lose a digit? And then on the other end of it, you're being very, very quick and very efficient with your cutting. So that's that's giving people confidence in the kitchen. And uh, also importantly, you're not wasting a lot of a lot of the onion. So, so often when we're chopping onions, we'll just kind of, you know, with big cuts, cut off the, the flower end and the root end, and you're losing a lot of good onion there. So he always starts off that way. Each of the two presentations that we did lasted about an hour. And so uh, we had a little bit of discussion in there, but you know, like I said, Peter teaching some basic cooking skills, um, but they mainly featured three, what he calls utilizer recipes. And these are the same as uh, the hero recipes that, that Anne mentioned. They're all those recipes that are really good at capturing just, you know, whatever kind of leftovers you might have in your fridge or your pantry. And the first one that Peter demonstrated was a bruschetta. And all of the food he brought, he had kind of salvaged from the food bank, things that were starting to near the end of their shelf life that, that wouldn't be responsible to, to donate back out. So he brought those um, as the demonstration aid. So here we had some wrinkly tomatoes that were getting kind of old, and we had some stale baguette that he turned into a bruschetta. Uh, up next, he demonstrated a curry, what we playfully called a catch-all curry. And it is, it really is a hero recipe because of all of those really strong and complex spices that you use in curries. It can pull together seemingly disparate components. If, if you've got a lot of leftover veg or protein in your fridge, you might think, oh, I don't know how I can bring all that together. Curries are great at that. Um, so he demonstrated a curry recipe. And then finally, he ended it with a compote. So we're trying to hit all the different foods that you may have, fruits, vegetables, proteins, grains, trying to bring it all together with these three recipes. And compote, once again, great for old kind of wrinkly berries or fruits with bruises on them. And I want to go back and kind of reiterate too that, that Peter was excellent at not only teaching the recipe, but also instilling cooking skills as he's going through it. So for example, uh, with this compote recipe, he had a bruised peach with him and he talked about how stone fruit, those fruits with very large pits, that bruises tend to go straight down to the pit itself. They don't radiate out from the bruise. So by using a paring knife and making a perp perpendicular cut on the fruit right down to the stone, you can very precisely remove that bruise without sacrificing any of the other uh, good peach that you have left. And, and he'd like to make the point too that that remaining peach is probably some of the best peach you're gonna have because it's that peak ripeness. So he did that through all the recipes. It's sharing these really great uh, cooking skill tidbits. Now, of course, Peter wasn't talking the entire time. He would he would take center stage while he was going through the, the various steps of each recipe. But then there was points when he had to be chopping something or sauteing something. And so I acted as his co-presenter and we kind of passed the microphone back and forth, so to speak. So while he was doing one of those in-between steps, I would jump in and I was providing a lot of information to our audiences. And so just like with Anne's um, events that she talked about, I started off by first stating the issue because it's not very widely known that, you know, USDA estimates 30 to 40 percent of food is, is wasted in the U.S. Um, but sometimes these issues can seem very large and very distant and, and not super relevant to those that are attending our events. So I tried to bring it down to the personal level, too. And we've got a lot of statistics for that, um, that the, the average family of four wastes roughly a quarter of the food that they buy and that this can have you know, a financial impact on them of up to $1,500 per year. So those types of statistics that we're all pretty familiar with is what I used for that. And, but I did try to draw on some of the other issues as well that um, you know, all the other environmental impacts uh, associated with wasted food and that there's also this other side of it where we have a lot of people that are facing economic hardship, they're, they're in situations of poverty and they're facing food insecurity and that um, it could be a good short-term um, opportunity to connect excess food with those who are facing food insecurity. After that, uh, whenever I would have a chance, I'd also start to interject some of the other strategies that we can use at home too, that we, we shouldn't be shopping 
uh, mindlessly that we should really make a good effort to, to plan the meals that we're going to have, know how many people are going to eat those meals so that we can look at the recipe and know exactly how much to buy. We're going to make some lists before we go shopping so we don't accidentally buy something we already have, uh, you know, looking in the, in the fridge, in the pantry to make sure um, that, we, that we do indeed need those items. And then some of the other more advanced techniques too, like pickling and canning and looking at some, some recipes for cooking root to leaf, uh, identifying those parts of vegetables that aren't commonly used. We had a question and answer section towards the end as Peter was wrapping up the, the recipes. And um, there was tons of questions about the date label question, just like Anne uh, mentioned earlier in her presentation. Uh, there's huge confusion around it between best buy, used buy, sell buy, freeze buy. Um, it's, it's immensely confusing. And so we just all of a sudden got all these questions back to back. How long can I keep a turkey frozen in the freezer? Or how long does celery stay good in the crisper? It was just a whole deluge of those types of questions. And, and really we tried to impress upon people that the dates are not federally regulated, that they're just the best guess of the manufacturer of freshness, not necessarily an indication of food safety and that we should be discerning and use our senses. And then as uh, my other presenting uh, cohort here today, we finished up the, uh, the demonstrations as well by talking about recycling, by saying, even if you're you know a superhero at not wasting food, you're gonna have that little bit of bruised peach and you're gonna have that little bit of onion end left and that we shouldn't be wasting these valuable organics by sending them to landfill or incineration, that we should be recycling them and that we have a good process for doing that at home. And uh, so we, we had an informational table too in the demonstration kitchen where we provided the recipes and where we also provided some, some other resources for, for composting and the like. So that was our first event that we did. Um, the second one uh, also took place in the Syracuse, New York area, which uh, for those of you who are joining from other parts of the country, Syracuse is kind of centrally located in the state of New York. A um, little bit urban in the city itself, but very quickly gets rural. And uh, the second event we, we titled Loving Local, Wasting Less. And what it was, we built it as a zero waste farm to table dinner and we were just over the moon. We had 100 guests come. They were from the, the greater Syracuse area community. And the whole idea behind the dinner was to take five chefs from Syracuse and five farmers from the central New York region and pair them together. So each chef was paired with a farmer. And the idea was to go onto their farm and see what was ever, whatever was left over uh, from the harvest season and to create a five course meal um, from that leftover produce that they gleaned. So each chef um, was charged with creating one of the five courses that was, was served at the dinner. And this, this whole event would not have been possible uh, without some very strategic partnerships that we were able to, uh, that we were able to create. And the first one was with uh, Mark Palu. He's the owner of, uh, of a company called Farm to Fork 101. And when I had the idea for this dinner and started researching around the Syracuse area, I discovered Mark and this dinner series that he's been running since 2015. And so essentially once a month, he gets one farmer together and uh, one chef and he, he gets together roughly 30 or 40 people and they have a dinner just to kind of celebrate the skills of that chef and to, to celebrate all of the produce that that local farmer um, brings, to the, brings to the area and really just kind of a celebration of local food. So when I heard this, I thought, wow, this is a perfect opportunity um, to, to get at the wasted food issue through the celebration of local food. And Mark's already got a process. He knows a lot of the local chefs. He knows a lot of the local farmers. Um, he already has a big following of people who come to these events. So I contacted Mark and we sat down and had a meeting and I pitched my idea to him about taking his model and expanding it a little bit. So instead of one chef and one farmer, bringing in five of each and, and increasing our audience a little bit too. So we had a hundred people instead of 30 or 40. And he was super excited about it, very supportive. Um, and it just would have been so much harder without him because he already had a process for the insurance and for health inspection and all of those things that we might not think about until we try to <laughs> create one of these events by ourselves. So uh, I just wanna really send my kudos out to Mark. Another great partnership for this event too was with Chuck Hafner's Farmers Market and Garden Center. When we were looking for venues uh, to host this dinner, we we got in touch with them, and fortuitously they had been considering lending out some of their greenhouse space as another business model, as as just lending it out as as event spacing. And since they hadn't done it before, they decided to do a trial run with us, and therefore didn't charge us for the use of that space. So just that was a very lucky thing in, in my opinion, but. 
um, we wouldn't have found it unless we were out just kind of looking around and asking questions too. So the night began, we had everybody come in, we had a space where people could get together and mingle and, and just kind of get settled in and, and, and meet other people who were there. And uh, just to kind of go back to this, this whole night is based off of Mark's idea that we wanted people to, to celebrate the local food community. And by doing so, kind of internalize the true value of food so that when they're at home and if they're accidentally wasting something, maybe they'll think twice about it. Like, wow, you know what? I had that dinner where I saw the farmer and all the effort that he put into growing that food and, and that chef who, who talked about all the different ways that I could use it. Maybe there's something I can do too to waste less at home. So we had everybody come in and we thought that was a great opportunity to just have a side table with a bunch of resources. So we had some displays and some some flyers that people could take home. There was a recipe book there called Amazing Waste uh, that some undergrad students had created. Um, and just like with Anne's too, we, we had a virtual pledge. So we're trying to, to push people beyond just increasing their awareness and their knowledge, but to actually make you know, an internal personal commitment to paying attention to this at home and to, to making a difference. So after the initial mingling period, we got everybody seated down. We intro, introduced some of the main coordinators for the event and uh, just kind of introduced the night and told everybody what to expect. And then that was a great opportunity for me and my team to, to do a short, um, verbal presentation about the wasted food issue, what the issue is, why is it important, and why should we be paying attention to it? And, and we all know the, the background to that. And then we took a moment too to talk about some of the very feasible things, the habitual things that we can do at home to solve it. So this is me and my colleague Lisa demonstrating some some proper storage techniques. Um, and that's a it's a mug of fresh cilantro that she had had in her fridge, I think going going on three weeks or so. And so she brought that with her to demonstrate how putting it, cutting the ends like flowers, putting it in some water and putting it in your fridge can really significantly extend the shelf life of that. So we did our introduction. And then we started uh, bringing out the dishes. So course one came out. And as each course came out, we would bring the farmer and the chefs up to the front of the room so they could talk about the dish. The farmer could talk about the produce that they grow and everything that goes into growing it and, and why it's nutritious and why it's good for us. Um, and after that, he would pass it off to the chef who would talk about uh, what the dish was, how they cooked it, um, perhaps how they were creative in using parts of vegetables um, or fruits that, that aren't so often consumed. And so it was just a really good kind of informational period as people were, were starting to eat. Um, and they, they just, I feel like they're kind of creating personal connections too with the farmers and with the chef. That was the whole kind of idea behind the night. Once again, to create this internalized, this inherent value of food. So here are the, the five dishes that we, um, that not me, the, the chefs and the farmers created. Uh, the first course was a kohlrabi leaf and carrot rice dolma. So if you, you know what dolma is, typically made with grape leaves, uh, but the chef for this dish, his farmer that he partnered with had just a ton of kohlrabi left over. And typically when we think kohlrabi, we're thinking about the bulb. So he had this idea, oh wow, what can I do with all those leaves? Let's make a dolma out of it. Same thing with this chef, uh, his farmer had lots and lots of collard greens still on farm. So he made uh, collard greens uh, with, with a chili broth. And this was a super it, flavorful dish. It was just packed full of flavor. And I think it was one of, the, one of the more favorite dishes of the night from the feedback that some of the attendees gave me. Um, Peter Ricardo from my first events, he participated in this one and his dish that he created with his partnering farm was a reconstructed bacon, lettuce and tomato. So this takes some backstory. The farmer he partnered with had lots of green tomatoes left over. So Peter thought, hmm, green tomatoes, how about fried green tomatoes? What if we put fried green tomatoes in a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich? And so that's what he did. Fried green tomatoes, instead of the lettuce, he had uh, charred greens in there. And then for our vegan and vegetarian attendees, he took the charred stem, chopped it up, and charred it on the stove top. So his joke was, it's charred, charred and um, use that as the smoky element to, to replace the bacon. Very creative, very fun and tasty dish. Our other chef and farmer uh, duo created a vegetable medley lasagna, just all kinds of that, you know, fall vegetables that, that farmers have uh, was turned into a lasagna. And then last but not least, what I thought was super fascinating was this beetroot sorbet that our final chef and farmer partnership created. Very tasty. You know how beets can be kind of sweet. I'd never thought about putting it in a dessert recipe before. So this was a great demonstration of how foods can be used in ways that, that you wouldn't typically think of. Just like Anne and Gary, I want to um, 
you know, really encourage everybody that when you're holding wasted food reduction or prevention events, that we should really try to go beyond that too. It would be so counterintuitive to say, hey, we shouldn't be wasting food, but then to serve those samples on single use plastic. So for our event, we really tried to go low, zero waste. All of the place settings were rented and then any leftover plate scrapings that we had uh, were composted. It was, it was actually very little for a hundred people um, the chefs did a really good job of trying to portion control. So at the end of the night, I think we had just a little less than a gallon of uh, plate scrapings that we gave back to Chuck Hafner's farmer's market. They composted that at their farm and then they <laughs> sold it back at their, their garden center. It was a good little closed system there. Um, I'm sure many of you are wondering, Jesse, how did you fund this event? Um, sure, it was expensive. And so it was really a pretty creative cobbling together of different funding sources. As I mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, my staff time and the, the time of my colleagues was funded through the, the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute's community grants program. So all of my, my time work on that was, was accounted for. Uh, we did charge for the tickets for this event. So tickets were $40 a piece and we had 100 guests. So that was a big chunk of the budget there and all of that money went back to the participating chefs for their time but it also went back to the farmers as well what we really wanted to con convey through those tickets and through that price is that we can pay farmers for things that are left over on their field and we can create a delicious fancy five course meal from it so we really wanted to convey that value through the ticket price but also cover our expenses too and then we had sponsors uh, you know from chuck hafner's they provided the venue free of charge for us we had some donations. Some of our participating chefs were nice enough to let us borrow their plates and, and glasses and silverware. Uh, the only um, payment we had to make for that was washing them uh, at the end of the night before we returned them. And then finally, we had some student volunteers from the university to help us with various tasks like filling up water glasses. I want to encourage everybody when you're taking the time to, to create these events to, to promote yourself to local media because they can hugely increase your reach um, as was demonstrated with, with this event. We reached out to, to as many of the local media outlets that we could. We had a couple of online news articles written about us. Uh, here you see a photo of a local news company that came to, to cover the event um, doing interviews with some of the coordinators and, and getting b-roll of everybody enjoying the dinner and doing a, a short piece uh, for, for live news. And then the week before this event, we were also invited to participate in a, in a morning show for our local news in Syracuse, where we not only got to pitch the event coming up to try to boost our attendance, but we got to, in a very short segment, promote the wasted food issue and some solutions as well. So it was just a way for us to go beyond those 100 people and to reach a much larger audience. Um, and similarly, uh, I encourage everybody to, to document your events as much as possible. Our phones today have incredible cameras on them, so take photos, take videos whenever you can, and this will allow you to create secondary outputs that will um, enable you to, to, it'll give you longevity to your efforts and it'll allow you to get to other audiences too. And um, this, is, this is what we did. We had a little bit of our grant budget that we we're able to devote to hiring a videographer who uh, went on site and he filmed the chefs cooking their meals. He went to the farms and, and filmed the gleaning of some of the food. And then he also filmed the whole of night. And, and, and through that, he created for us a 15 minute mini documentary that we titled Loving Local Wasting Less. Here's the URL. Um, we can copy that and paste that into the chat box so that uh, everyone can have a look at that if you'd like. It goes into much greater detail about this event and I think it probably does it in a, in a much better way than I'm doing here with, with this presentation. Um, but now this is something that lives on and I can share it with other partners and, and they can see what I did and they can model after it or they can share with their audiences to to inspire them to get more knowledgeable about the issue or to take some action at home. So yeah, definitely be documenting your events when you're doing this because like Gary said, people love food. They're super interested by food. So let's let's utilize that. Here's my, I'm still working from home. So here's my contact info. Uh, don't got a, a, a phone number for you right now, but here's my email address. And I'd be more than happy to provide you with more details about these events or to to talk about an event that you're you're looking to, to plan. And uh, yeah, just be happy to, to talk to anybody about wasted food and ideas that you have for um, moving this forward in our communities. So thank you all uh, for, for giving me some of your time today and, and for listening. And I'll be happy to answer some questions at the end of this. But before we move into that, I did wanna just leave a little bit more room for Ann and Gary and myself to talk about how we're thinking of using the Repair Cafe model to develop a virtual recook cafe.
Gary, why don't you kick us off? Anne and Gary have to unmute themselves. Do I have to give the presenter mode back? Ah, oh, I'm now unmuted. I had some trouble. Can you all hear me? Go ahead, Gary. Sure, great. Jesse, that was fantastic. Thank you. And so, Anne, Jesse, and I have been talking about this for a while now, this idea of a, a virtual recook cafe. And like Jesse's model, it would engage chefs. And um, it's, you know, one of the beauties of virtual is it's nationwide. And so we plan to partner with NERC and NUMOA for a second session, if you will, where each station that you go to, like in a repair cafe, will be something different. We have engaged Peter, which um, Jesse was talking about. And engage is a great word for Peter because he is such an engaging presenter. So uh, that chef will be talking about knife work and some other things. We will have uh, a total of four chefs, I think we agreed on. And uh, part of it will be talking about stems and how you can create new recipes out of stuff that people don't even think of as food. And if you want to jump in here, welcome to. Yeah, we thought some of the stations could be um, organized around those utilizer or hero recipes, since they're things that people aren't so familiar with cooking. Right, so may, yeah, so we have a plan to do something with fruit and we have a plan to do something with veggies. And, um, you know, the part of the thing that we think is most engaging is it's gonna be like a cooking show where you'll be told in advance what ingredients are gonna be used. I think the challenge for us as folks educating about wasted food reduction is that we understand that people might go out and buy things that they wouldn't have in their fridge. So we're still working with that because we want to, you know, be as sustainable as possible. But uh, some of the sessions we expect will be cooking demos that people can actually participate in and some they'll be watching. And of course, as you know, anyone is welcome to watch and not necessarily do the demo themselves. So thanks guys. Um, I, you know, we, we will let people know who registered for this webinar when we've scheduled the, this virtual recook cafe. Um, we do have a lot of questions, so I really want to get to some of the questions. I'm going to turn it over to Lynn. Great. Thank you. And uh, boy, talk about fabulous presentations. And yes, uh, Gary, you were right that Jamie's uh, presentation made me hungry. It's gorgeous. Um, so we've actually had several questions about transitioning the events that you have all done to virtual. Have you come up with a way to do it? So we appreciate that the Recook Cafe is a, a new way of presenting, you know, how to cook. But the broader educational ones, you know, that Anne and Gary have talked about and, you know, Jesse in a different context, you know, have you puzzle through how you might offer those as virtual events. So that would be for any of you who want to speak up. Yeah, this is Gary. I had the opportunity to participate in one way back in April. It was in a rural community in upstate New York that had their uh, spring earth festival scheduled. And then of course they had to scramble and they had about a month to change formats entirely. And what they came up with was a week long instead of a one day festival. And it allowed them to engage different partners and, um, you know, present content. And the session I was in, I, I had a similar role to what Anne had. And they engaged a chef who pre recorded a wonderful demo on using things in the kitchen that she just happened to have and creating these wonderful meals. And so what I liked about it is it was a 10 minute video and, and she was there in person to answer questions. That worked pretty well. 
So excuse me. So so you did you showed the video, or people could watch it at a different time. So during that particular time slot, the I did a live presentation uh, just to set the stage, and then the video was shown. Ah, okay, great, thanks. And you know, I'll add to that. It was a Zoom meeting, and so there was an opportunity for people to see each other and engage in conversation. It's pretty great. impractical when you have hundreds and hundreds of people, but for a smaller group, it works. Okay, thank you. And Anne, have you uh, puzzled this one out? I have not done anything similar. We've been discussing how to do or make this transition successfully. Um, so I would actually put it out to the group. And if anyone has done anything similar and wants to help us out, we would love to hear from you. Um, I did have a partner in Vermont um, through the Vermont Department of Health and she runs cooking classes um, through a community access TV station. And she did take the recipes and do like a half hour cooking show. Um, so that's something that is recorded that you can watch. But it, again, it's not kind of a um, virtual online thing where you could be asking questions. It's pre-recorded. Right. Okay. So we need to use a mix of both. Um, you know, we're we're still figuring it out. Sure. Well, aren't we all? Yes. Mm. Uh, that's great. Thank you. So we've also had uh, uh, several questions about whether each of you, whether you follow up with participants to see what they might have implemented or for additional information they wish in retrospect that they had. So again, that's for everybody. I can I can jump in there. So for um... For the, this, this goes beyond the Loving Local Wasted Less dinner. So we had that virtual pledge there that you saw on my demonstration table. And so for the whole year that we did uh, that grant, we were interfacing with different audiences and groups. And anybody that took the pledge, there was a little disclaimer once you entered your information, because you also had to provide your email. And that was one mechanism that I used to, um, to be able to, to do a survey to, to those that we were providing information for. So. Um, at the end of the grant, I sent out a survey to say, hey, how did your how did your pledge go? Were you able to accomplish the things that you wanted to when you made the pledge? And got some really interesting feedback. I could I could provide um, the results from that survey to to this group uh, to anyone that wanted to see that. And all all kinds of stuff. People were saying, oh wow, I'm saving a lot of money now by wasting less food. Or other people said, I'm having a really hard time with this because I have one member of my family at home who is who is just not into it. They they don't want to take the time to to think about it. So there was a lot of mix between some successes and then obstacles as well. And it was it was very illuminating. So so yeah, I would I would say definitely if you can do um, if you can do surveys or if you can do evaluations, it provides some helpful information after the fact. Great. Others want to contribute to the answer? I have not followed up with the participants apart from the very first workshop where we asked them to do an evaluation because we were using it as a pilot in uh -huh. developing, you know, further workshops. Right. So, yeah. um, but it's something that we would love to do to see yeah, which strategies have stuck and what kind of information they would like more of. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. Okay. Yeah, I'm grateful for that question. I think that uh, as educators, we need to really listen. Now. And in my case, obviously, there's no evaluation when it's a, a display that you're partic yeah. that you're interacting with. But you know, always asking what would you like to see, uh, and then changing the display accordingly. Right. Great. Great. Now, do any of you um, have an ideal target audience? So, do you? Do you seek to get certain types of participants? The questioners ask things like, are you actually after families? Are you after actually after people with, you know, who are income challenged or, you know, whatever? Uh, you know, so do you actually have a wish list of who's going to be in the audience? I can't say that. I do. Um, I will say that if you if you want to target income challenge folks, I think working with Cornell or not Cornell with the cooperative extensions because they most of them throughout the country have uh, a mission of educating 
folks in that category about nutrition and getting the most out of their food. So it's a natural ally. Um, I'll let others chime in. Yeah, I second Gary's thoughts there. So um, to kind of look around and see if there are other organizations doing similar things that you are and already reaching those audiences. But I, when I'm looking at the residential side of things, I'm trying to find those groups that are already established. So um, for example, if I want to try to get after middle school and high school students, I'm, I'm now looking to family and consumer science teachers to say, hey, you know, maybe we can set up something for your class. And this might be relevant now, depending on what schools do state to state across the country with, with going back in person or, or going fully online or some hybrid in between the two. Um, you know, I, I try to look for those areas where I already got a congregation of, of people that I could maybe capture and do, do a one-off or a couple, like a small series of events too. And just to add to that, when Jesse says family and consumer sciences, it's what some of us older folks used to call home, home economics. And so most schools have something like that often in the seventh and eighth grade and teachers teach to that. So I've gotten a chance to train some of those teachers and um, you know, they're hungry for this because it, it fits right into their curriculum. That's great. Thank you for the translation, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> What that what that job title specifically was so i, I will uh, mention uh, along the lines of your target audience you know taking the pledge for instance um we have uh, an online pledge that folks could take they could use a link and and do it live right at the event and you know as you might imagine it was more tech savvy and often younger folks who want to do that and older folks who are saying give me that piece of paper so i could write uh, it down uh-huh. Yep. Good point. Good point. Just a quick reminder to the folks that are still here that we do have these three handouts, um, recipes and uh, tips for using food wisely. So two recipe worksheets and tips for using food wisely. Um, the, Lynn, I wanted to circle back if I can yeah, to of course. A, a question that was asked, which is about online forums. And one of the things that some of my colleagues at DEC have we've talked about and we haven't done yet and actually we brought it to jesse as well this idea of having working with sustainability folk local sustainability folk to jump start local kind of zoom groups around wasted food reduction and certainly other things could come up but you know like i said before everyone has something they want to share or learn about food and so it's a natural kind of gateway into other issues if you want to, you know, address climate or, or resource use. Great idea. Great idea. Although one, one of our um, uh, audience members said, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to talk about food waste, I feel like I'm speaking to the choir. So how do you get past that? How do you draw people into these sorts of conversations? We don't already agree with everything you're going to say. Cooking, right? So Cooking. You know, this, <laughs> this idea, I don't think we, we mentioned fully what this idea is going to be about this Recook Cafe, or maybe we did, but it, it, I'm going to repeat it if we did. Okay, please do. Uh, having examples peppered throughout. So yeah, it might seem like a cooking show, but all throughout those chefs are gonna be talking to you about how you could use things in your kitchen and get the most out of your food. So it's both. So you're talking about something that everyone cares about and putting in all this other stuff that they may or may not care about, but they're gonna learn about. Right, right, yep. I, I, can add, I, I yeah, would I can also add. add. Oh, yes, yeah. I just add that you know engaging partners so the food shelf in vermont already does some form of cooking classes and so we've been talking about maybe working with them to expand their offerings to include how to reduce less um but less food or for how to reduce food waste sorry yeah. and then yeah. um, you know trying different unique partners like one of the things we did in the first work workshop was we provided everybody with um spent grain flour that was made from a switchback brewery and then we gave them recipes to go home and make crackers made from the spent grain and um so connecting with um in vermont there are lots of breweries all over and so maybe going to one of their brew fests and 
setting up a stand like Gary's and providing these crackers with some food. You know, that you just have to kind of think out of the box, but as yeah. Gary, everybody eats. So usually there's some food connection you can make with different partners, unlikely partners. Yeah, very interesting idea. I like it. I like and it. I, I wanted to add too, Lynn, that, you know, this yes, is something yes. I think about a lot in going beyond those audiences that I trip, typically um, draw to, to my events. How do I reach new audiences? I'm constantly thinking about that. And my strategy for my two events was to springboard off of other events that were already happening. And Gary and I recently had a discussion about it because it can be double edged. He was recalling to me that when he went to that repair cafe and he set up a table about food that most people were there with the mindset of you know repairing goods like a lamp or uh -huh. um, like a, a textile or something like that so i would say you'd have to be very mindful about the type of event that you're trying to springboard off of so for example at the at the new york state fair those cooking demonstrations were already happening people thought they were coming in to, to see a cooking demo, which they did, but <laughs> surprise, you also learned about wasted food reduction. Um, <laughs> and same thing with Mark Palu's Farm to Fork 101 dinners. There was a big following for that, and people were coming mainly to see local chefs and to yeah. have a local food dinner. Um, but once again, surprise, you're learning about wasted food reduction and having a meal that was created out of clean produce. That's great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and I think that I may have called you Jamie before, so apologies for that. Um, a couple, we, we only have a couple. I doesn't. <laughs> sorry to hear it. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna hopefully give you a couple of really quick questions. But I want to comment that the audience is typing into their question box a lot of compliments, uh, well deserved. I want you guys to know that that's coming in. Um, so Jesse, you told us about the totally amazing place at the State Farm Affair that where you did your event. But um, Anne and Gary, what sort of? Um, well, Gary, you did at a fair also, but. What other sorts of venues might you do a, a training like this at? So, Anne, what sort of physical settings have you been in? And you all three have been brainstorming about other ways to partner. So what other sorts of venues might you use to do these uh, cooking events? Well, our first venue happened in a place called the Richmond Community Kitchen, and they're a relatively new business where they um, cook and sell food, but um, they also have a kitchen that you can rent and um, they put on cooking classes, but you can have events there as well. So um, that was probably the easiest place for us to have an event because they had all the equipment that we needed, um, but it was also the most expensive. So then our next event was at a library where they had a very small kitchen and we ended up bringing a lot of the materials um, needed and we scaled down the cooking portion um, because of that. But, you know, I think it was equally um, beneficial and powerful event. Um, and then the last one we did was actually at a, um, oh gosh, what do they call it? Um, a place where it's a commercial kitchen where people also rent the space and come in and make their bulk, you know, salsa to sell or pickles or. Um, oh, so a shared cooking space. Right, there's a name for it, but I see what you mean. The co kitchen Yeah, there's a different okay. name. I'm forgetting it. Um, so, and that was great too, because they had all the equipment. Um, you know, we had to follow more strict guidelines. That was the picture where you saw us wearing the hair nets because we were in a commercial kitchen that was actually used. Yeah. So that's another option if you have places like that. Um, and so then- excuse me, an, an audience member tells us they're incubators. Incubators, okay, that's, that's <laughs> great. Um, and then our um, Vermont Department of Health in some regions has been really active in identifying all the public kitchens. And so I know in the Rutland area, um, we have actually a map where you can just type in where you are and all these different locations will pop up. So maybe other um, places around the country have something like that, a list of publicly accessed kitchens. Um, but I would say, you know, kind of the the sky's the limit as long as you can, you know, have maybe some access to a sink and electricity, you could really make one of these events anywhere. It just depends on the amount of uh, work you need to do to get it set up beforehand. Right. I just want to throw in a quick cautionary note that uh, in, in, at least in New York State, there's insurance and other issues and training that needs to happen when you're preparing and uh, eating food. So you just need to be careful. And I've done events in churches 
where you know I've come in and, and talked about it and brought a cutting board and just done some quick little demos and then there's no food sharing. So that's a way to go if you can't actually be preparing and eating food together. So Gary, is that a low uh, so are you complying with local community state. requirements? It's a state requirements. New York okay. State Health Department stuff. Great. Great. Well um we have a lot of questions. Apologies to those who've been posting these great questions that we're not going to answer them on the webinar. Um, but perhaps you'll all join us again for the pending Recook Cafe, and you'll have some more questions. Again, fabulous presentations, everybody. And Terry, thanks for organizing this. Uh, and uh, all of you will be receiving a link or links up to the PowerPoint presentations and a recording of the webinar. All of those will be available on both the NERC and NMOA websites, and you'll get links to it. So don't worry about that. And again, thank you to our audience and to our speakers and to uh, NMOA for partnering with NERC. And I think with that, we can say good afternoon. Correct, Terry? Yes, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lynn, for moderating the, the Q&A. And uh, hopefully all of you who are still on the, on the webinar will be joining us later for sometime this fall for our recook our virtual recook cafe our virtual so, yeah. <laughs> yes so Great. everyone take care and be safe and healthy and uh it's lovely to see all these events with people who don't have masks on and that's something we can aspire to in the future <laughs> <laughs> memories <laughs> now i'm going to eat something because i'm so hungry for watching <laughs> thanks everybody bye-bye bye-bye thank you thank you